Hello everyone. Well, I think we're live. It's Margot Metcalf from the IEC group. I'm really just here for the first 30 seconds or so just to um, have a little bit of small talk while everyone's logging in. And to introduce Lee, Lee Hicken is the National Technology Officer at Microsoft. And uh, Lee is going to be talking to us about some innovations around autonomous systems powered by AI. Um, just want to remind you that there's the prizes on offer. The gold trophy in the top right hand corner is where you go to check out the prizes. If you have any questions during Lee's session, please put them in the live Q&A component on the panel on the right. And at the end of Lee's presentation, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. So it's over to you, Lee. Thank you, Margo, for the introduction. I appreciate that. And hopefully everyone can hear me and see me and see my slides uh, as expected. Please do let me know, Margo, if, uh, if there's any problems with the feed. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak in this, uh, this sort of keynote session on autonomous systems. Um, and as Margo said, so my role at Microsoft, I'm the National Technology Officer uh, or Chief Technology Officer, however you want to phrase it. Uh, and it's a very broad role I get. It's a, it's a great opportunity for me to really get across the gamut of everything that, that Microsoft does, but probably more so what makes this role interesting is I tend to look more outside of Microsoft and see what's happening in and around the industry, in the sectors and the markets in Australia uh, that are most relevant to, um, to the technology sector. So um, fantastic, I get to do everything from, from health, safety and technology, AI, quantum computing and everything in between, which is uh, super exciting. So this first session uh, that I'm presenting for you now is on autonomous systems. And let's start, uh, if we're my slides, we'll go through nicely. Let's start with kind of a, just a really, a glance back at what do we mean by autonomous and how do we get here? Because um, autonomous is just another iteration in the way in which we as humans have continued to evolve our approach to industrialization and mechanization of the systems and services that we build and deliver. Uh, and, and this is, you know, we've talked about this in multiple different ways, the multiple industrial revolutions, the mechanization uh, movement and, and, and sort of the birth of steam and as we move through those journeys. But what I think is interesting and relevant to this audience is as we, as every time as a, as a society we've stepped forward either through the mechanization by introduction of steam and electricity or through automation of systems where we had sort of robotics and software driven uh, intelligent systems in, in, in uh, workspaces to where we're heading to now with, with autonomous systems, in all those scenarios, what we've introduced is yes, great opportunity and great innovation and great capability, but also significant challenges, risk, potential for harm, and a complexity to the work environment that is often um, you know, probably a secondary thought to sometimes uh, this journey of, of sort of automation and, 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 and evolution. So, I'm just showing a video here in the background. Hopefully you can see it. There's no audio, but this is actually something that we, uh, we showcased a couple of years ago now. I think it might've even been 2017. Uh, and this was a video that was a journey for us to start thinking about how do we explore where AI and technology such as cameras and sensors could be brought into the modern world and brought into the modern work environment. And we see a whole range of things in this short video. You'll see, you know, that's for environment. So using cameras to detect a change in the physical space. We've got real-time monitoring alerts coming into devices and individuals and helping humans figure out and understand where the hazards exist. Um, we might have seen in this video also the identification of personal safety gear. Are people wearing the right gear when they're in the right places? And IoT sensors everywhere uh, sort of there to capture and then warn of impending failures and breakdowns. And all of this technology that we sort of showcased a few years ago, uh, it's super exciting, it's very powerful, and, it, and it's in place today, and we see a lot of this happening already. But it was really about keeping humans safe and ensuring they could go about their work in the normal way. The gap here was, was learning and autonomy. How do we teach these systems now to be more predictive? Uh, how do we help them to remediate? And then how do we help them to sort of avoid those risks completely? How do we stop the barrel falling over? How do we stop the bad thing happening in the first place to remove that risk of, uh, of, of safety uh, risk if from the work environment? So when we think about this now, this journey from sort of AI as a tool to the now autonomous AI systems that are interacting and move, moving and working around humans in the workspace, it's important to remember that a lot of this stuff you know, we talk about technology running at a, at a tremendous pace and changing things, but 
technology is built by humans and it's humans that are driving that that pace and bring that intu in, uh, intuition to these machines. And so when we kind of break that down into where are we spending our time, it's first of all, it's about how do we unlock new capabilities? So how do we take technology like drones and, and sensors and capabilities like that, but how do we unlock new capabilities in old systems? So how do we look at agriculture, for example, and how does drones bring not just innovation in the farming experience, but actually change the risk profile, change the safety profile, change the way in which farming is done to, uh, you know, kind of completely adjust the way that the humans and machines interact in that kind of environment. Beyond the capabilities, you know, we also look deeply to think about how do we optimize the environments in which our, organ our, our work gets done. And by this, we mean more about kind of the you know, the energy usage, the, 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 the safety of the environment, is the air clean, is it safe, is the temperature right, and all of those things that are very different, obviously, from an office work environment to say what you see on the screen here from a farming environment, but they're all similar, very similar challenges. How do we measure and make sure that we're working and providing our employees with the safest and uh, best environment within, within which to work? And then lastly, and of course, probably most relevant for today's conversation is how do we use technology and autonomous technology to improve safety? Um, and you know, and the, the obvious example that everyone can kind of point to and get a sense of is autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous driving vehicles and, and, and devices that we, you know, the, the discrete devices that go into those. So um, you know, automatic braking systems, uh, ABS control units, stability control, rear speed sensors, all of these kinds of stuff that go into cars and the compounding effect that that's having as we move towards autonomous vehicles and autonomous uh, driving vehicles as well, which is not what we're going to get to today, but is a, is a very clear example of something we, all, we can all kind of understand. So to kind of put that in a, in, a, in a neat little bundle, what we're trying to build with autonomous systems, not just Microsoft, but the industry as whole, is these autonomous systems that are capable of both sensing and responding to the changing environment to accomplish these outcomes that we want them to do, to work in conjunction with us, where they can remove humans from unsafe or untested environments and give us opportunities to do greater innovation. And that comes through some of the technology we can do through simulation in AI and autonomy, autonomous systems as well. But it's that really, that's, it's that sensing and dynamic responding, which in order to achieve that, we have to really got to get into the domain of AI and learning models and how do we teach these systems to behave autonomously. So if we think about autonomously and we think about what does that mean to us? What we're essentially saying is we want to put the trust of our lives and our safety into systems, devices, vehicles, or, or mechanisms that will help us in the event of, of the, our need or help prevent those situations from ever occurring. So it really plays heavily into this uh, very important and con uh, consideration that many of us have, which is what do we trust and how do we trust these systems and do we trust AI and in order to trust it, we have to understand it. We have to be, it has to be explainable. We have to have tested it and proven it in ways that are not going to bring or put humans into greater, uh, greater danger. And that's where we get into some of the work we're doing with autonomous systems and AI. So at a very high level, because we, we haven't got time to dive into it deeply, when we think about AI systems, we think about them in three very broad buckets. There are those AI systems that are unsupervised in their learning. So fundamentally, AI is a learned system. It, it behaves based on what it's taught. In an unsupervised system, you know, essentially you give an AI system uh, a million pictures of cats and have it just figure out which one is a cat and then you throw it a picture of a dog and it'll say to you, eh, based on what I've learned unsupervised by myself, that looks about 60% like a cat, but it's not really, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. And that's how unsupervised works. In a supervised model, it's really much more about that situation where we give it a thousand pictures of cats labeled as cats and then a thousand pictures of dogs labeled as dogs and horses and all other sorts of other animals. And we supervise the learning. We teach it by saying to it, here's a picture of a cat. Here's a picture of a dog. See the differences or learn the differences between them. Uh, a lot more process work involved, a lot more effort from the human side, but you get a, a more accurate model, but you require a lot more data. The last area where most of the work is going into is in this construct around reinforcement learning. Uh, so where we teach the machine to learn and then when it does something good or bad, we either reward or reinforce that behavior in a particular way. Kind of like when, you know, when you, if you're training a, training a dog to behave a certain way, you know, they get pats and treats for good behavior and they get scolded for bad behavior. That's a sense of a reinforcement learning. 
as we get into autonomous systems and where we're moving to now, we get into this idea of deep reinforcement. Thinking about those muscle memories that we all learn as children, how to ride a bike, how to play a sport. That mach- and that was a taught experience. That's something we didn't learn by being supervised or just learning by ourselves, but it's a teaching experience. And deep reinforcement learns by essentially bringing together that stateful reward and action based on those things. As a, as a reinforcement system, uh, learning how to navigate safely through an environment, we put a state in front of it, we ask it to assess the state, and then we re- re- reward, reward good decisions and not reward bad decisions until we arrive at a terminal point where uh, state is learned and, and, and there's no more rewards to give, so to speak. So it's kind of like, as I said, it's that teaching experience that we would take to any training of a sport or teaching a child to do something. You wouldn't teach a child to play a sport by showing them a thousand pictures of somebody holding a bat or or watching a hundred videos of somebody playing a sport. They wouldn't understand the nuances. You would teach a child to play a sport or ride a bike by showing them and then encouraging them and then asking them to do a little bit by themselves. And then when they fail, helping them and rewarding them and giving them a, sort of the, the, the mechanisms to move on and, and keep learning from that experience. And that's exactly what deep learning is, is on autonomous systems. It's exactly that process of, of teach, a, teach a piece, reward a piece, and then move forward from that learning. And it means we can move much faster at higher scale. There's technically less effort for the systems to run uh, in terms of the amount of computational needs to run those. And you often teach reusable concepts. What we forget as humans, the way we learn, we learn very basic concepts and then we apply them to very complex scenarios. And when you apply that same logic to autonomous system learning, you get the scenario where things the system may learn, it can then reapply to other environments. And critically, because it's a taught experience and it's an explainable uh, experience, we can explain why and how the machine might behave in a particular way. Now, this leads us to the next area is once we can teach a system how the real world works and how to achieve a particular task in this example, you know, dealing with crashing testing cars for optimal construction in crash um, in crash scenarios, it allows us to bridge into this world of simulation. So we don't want to go and crash 5,000 cars to figure out how to build the safest car to operate a particular environment across a range of scenarios on different road types and different weather, but we can simulate a million cars doing that for no cost and learn a lot more from that process. So now we start to bridge into this world of how do we simulate the real world so that machines can be safer and provide safety services to humans in the real world. Um, and so taking that car narrative further, how do we um, you know, look at the idea of say a, uh, a car, how do we teach an autonomous car to drive more safely on all the different road types and weather types? We could do that through simulation. How do we work where a physical test environment, such as the, uh, you know, the, the, the large um, uh, air fat capture fan you see there, how do we simulate that in a, in a lot computer environment that really emulates the real world and emulates all of the multiple different faceted uh, things that could happen in the real world because it's actually very costly, very difficult, and very specialized to go and work and operate on one of these large fans. So it's just not practical sometimes. Simulation gives us a tremendous amount of capability uh, when we look at it that way. So what you're looking at here is a product called AirSim. AirSim is a tool that we are developing uh, to enable you to take real world environment data uh, using sort of off the shelf stuff like the Unreal Engine or or Unity Engine, pulling in LiDAR or photogrammetry information, simulating the real world, simulating real world environments such as weather changes, objects in the way, all that kind of stuff to create tools that allow us to test and prove how machines should and could operate in a real world environment so that they can learn better before we actually put them into real world environments and they're, and they're more well equipped and more trained to operate in that way. And that AirSim tool set is something that can be applied to a whole range of scenarios. So it's open source, available to download from GitHub and play around with, uh, uses the, uh, the, those engines that are widely recognized, the Uni- uh, Unity and, Unifi- and um, Unreal engines pulling in all the typical data that you would see, as I said, photo images, models, physics, weather data, LIDAR, radar, and allows you to create these things. And you can bring in your own imagery data, so you can take real world images that you have in your own office, your own factory, your own work experience, work environment, or you can use the simulated engines that are there and simply teach a, a, a model. So in this case, people, 
or a device, a car, a drone, any kind of autonomous system can be taught to operate safely in the real world environment before you actually unleash the real device in the real world and therefore give it that level of trust that we know when it hits the real world, it's going to behave in a way that is safe, that is trusted, that is explainable and is something that, that as humans we're happy and we see the value in operating alongside of. This is a real turning point in the way in which we think about machines and systems and humans working together. And I'm going to uh, finish up the deck because uh, I think we're just heading into the, the time for questions uh, with a short video that's going to play. I'll let that Microsoft has a history of ethics in thinking about how technology impacts us on the human side. We have to be able to trust that the AI behind the machine intelligence is safe and secure. These robots can be used in just about any scenario where it's dangerous or infeasible to send humans in. It's very important to have a rich simulation and modeling environment in order to model scenarios. To make drones fly safely, we're working with Microsoft AirSim in the simulation environment and then comparing them against real world results. This is going to create an FAA regulatory world for the 21st century. The opportunity is to make all of this easy to use, to quickly build the models so they can simulate on a massive scale without being computer scientists. With these systems, we can solve some of today's biggest challenges. It now feels like we're hitting the real world. So I, I, I hopefully that video kind of gives you a sense of the the, the ways in which is, this is going and the areas that we can work in with autonomous systems. And, and you know, it really is a focus on, on not replacing where humans operate and replacing some of those skills that humans have, but it's about providing systems that work alongside humans and work in a way that we can trust that is built around uh, deep learning and deep capabilities driven by AI. And with that, I believe we are on time. And I'm open for questions, Margot, if you're still there. I don't know quite how the questions will work, but I'm, uh, I'm at your disposal. Yes, I am here. We have one question that's come through. Um, would be very interested to know any exciting developments in healthcare settings. Interesting. So um, actually, I'm going to talk about this in my uh, second session this afternoon. I think the, the closing keynote around uh, where we're doing some work in mixed reality uh, in the healthcare, not so much the autonomous systems today in uh, in healthcare, but one, one, when we think about AI in particular, we are seeing a tremendous amount of work happening in in a number of healthcare sectors on just using AI to do to do uh, the needle in the haystack problem. So when you fundamentally our, our ability to to solve some of these challenges in healthcare in particular is a data problem. We we want more and more data to help us understand the very broad spectrum of potential outcomes that may occur, say in, uh, in uh, identifying cancer cells or um, identifying particular neurological scenarios or pathways when doing brain scans and MRIs, that data is fundamentally quite hard for humans to, uh, to really get their head around the scope of it sometimes. The doctors and, uh, and physicians and others have a very specialized skill of identifying information, but how do we scale that? How do we do more of that? How do we allow that doctor to use their capability, their skill? How do we have them teach systems that can help them do their job faster and, do, and get to more patients and treat more people and determine urgency quicker so that we can identify um, you know, those that need uh, faster uh, access to medical uh, support? That's probably the biggest area, certainly not in the autonomous systems as yet. But, but who knows, as I said, three years ago, we were looking at AI just simply monitoring the world, and now we're talking about autonomous systems actually interacting in the world. One more question. Would AI or robotics be looked at for construction of homes and buildings? Uh, I see the question. Thanks, Ben. Um, look, at, that's a, I see no reason why not, but today we're not seeing that because there's a unique set of uh, manual dexterity that the human system has that robots and systems are developing, no doubt about it. We would have all possibly seen the work that Boston Dynamics are doing in their very high level manual dexterity robots. Um, but interestingly, one of the things we are seeing is, and again, it's in the mixed reality session, I could touch on this later on this afternoon. Um, when we infuse mixed reality into the real world, so we have We've got some building work going on. I forget the university that started this, where they're using mixed reality systems to virtually represent a building that needs to be built, a very complex, difficult design, you know, maybe with sort of unique curves and textures to the building. Having the, the mixed reality system 
push that into the physical world so you so a builder or an architect can see it and then actually having those with the skills say the the, the, the builders the bricklayers and the people that actually build things follow the dotted line of the model that's virtually in, in, put in front of them to build these very complex systems but it's still very much a human thing i, th I think there's a ways to go before we see the, the level of dexterity needed for robotics to go to the extent of building very complex objects like uh, like houses um, there's a couple more questions there, if you can see them, Lee. I, I can, yeah, I'll start working through them. Uh, the, the easy one from Anonymous, the stack for AI, for ASM, uh, programming languages, there's, it, it supports a whole raft of stuff. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go into the list of it, but I will, uh, I will share the links to the, to the GitHub re repo and the content in here. Um, and, you know, obviously, Python and a bunch of other typical services are where we see a lot of the building work, but let, let me share the detail rather than try to explain it all. Humans are known for behaving unpredictability. How does AI cater for this in safety? This is an interesting, excellent point. It's the sort of the, you know, the, the trolley cart uh, ethical dilemma, and this is where the ethics come into it. Humans are very good at making snap decisions based on uh, essentially what is their, 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 their mental bias. Who do I, what do I want to do in this situation? Do I protect myself? Do I protect the car? Do I protect the person I'm about to run over? You know, all those scenarios that we, we have to run through. It's part of the challenge of deep learning in AI is teaching machines, when we reward machines for certain behavior, we create a model inside the neurons in the system of the AI to recognize that that's a valued outcome from a human response. But the challenge we have is the system will continue to learn new things. So we may teach a machine learning system through deep learning to have empathy for a particular scenario. And, you know, I use a very bad example, but, you know, we, we recognize the value of youth. So we, we wouldn't, we would seek to not harm a child if there was an opportunity to not harm a child, for example. We can teach a system that, but then at the same time, over, over time, as that system learns more about uh, the way in which we operate, it may see behavior from humans that contradicts that, uh, that behaves in a different way, because in a different scenario, it is greater or better outcome to save a different, uh, you know, to, to, to drive towards a different outcome terrible example to use children in that but it's a very hard thing to do and that's where it's probably one of the biggest gaps today in teaching machines is giving them that sense of human empathy and um, emotion because in order to imbibe a system with that you have to give it all of the gamut of emotions and that creates a tremendous challenge because that is not something we can easily computationally um, map, map and model in the same way that we can more logical data sets. You touched on technology with farming. Is it integrated with livestock and animals? Absolutely. So um, one of the autonomous systems we're doing it well, a great example we did is actually work we did with uh, CSIRO uh, and the Kakadu Parks was actually using drone data, so drones that would fly autonomously over across the park, capturing imagery of um, magpie geese. And we were actually using the magpie geese as a marker for healthy country. More magpie geese meant that the land was healthy, and this was based on some indigenous um, uh, six seasonal knowledge about how the land grows and how it re repairs. Uh, they were counting the magpie geese and using drones to identify them, using uh, uh, image ident identification to identify what is magpie geese and types of magpie geese and, and that, and then using that data to measure that. So absolutely, it's very applicable to farming in other ways as well, whether it be livestock counting or livestock tracking or, or looking for markers like, you know, animals that are showing signs of being pregnant and out in the field and that need to be brought in for, for help. We've seen examples of that in AI. 20 seconds of... I see, yes. <laughs> Introducing vehicles and public roads. Do I see AI? Uh, well, we're already there to a day, to, to, today to a certain extent in that the vehicles could do it. Whether we allow it is a different question. Um, you're in an ethical dilemma question. For me, Sonia, yes, I see great... I like to see the positive and the opportunity. I think it'd be amazing to think that we could be in a world where autonomous vehicles are used. I see great opportunity for safety, simplicity, and, and greater experience of our lives as we move around and there's more of us and more vehicles. Autonomous vehicles can solve some of those problems. But as we've seen already, um, there are a tremendous amount of challenges around that uh, and still you know, uh, a long way to go in terms of really getting systems that truly understand the, the nature of what it's like to, to live and work in a human environment. We will send the questions through to Lee to see if he has any other resources or links that he can provide and they'll be sent to everyone at the end of the event. Um, with just 20 seconds left, I just want to thank Lee very much. Just a reminder that uh, part two of this keynote is on at 3.07 this afternoon on the dot. Uh, you've got five minutes until the next session starts, so please feel free to visit the exhibitors and uh, jump into the meeting hub. 
Thanks very much, Lee.